Food. Food. One of the best parts is food and um, being able to grow your own food, which is not necessarily every cooperative. It depends on land access, but we happen to have a really productive, beautiful garden, and summertime is the best time. Um, I'm making at least three jars of pesto a week <laughs> with all of our basil. Um, tomatoes are coming in now. We have okra and peppers and green beans and uh, squash and cucumbers and so uh, having food and access to food and sharing food and cooking food together and eating food together is a huge part of living in this specific co-op and I think lots of co-ops. Yeah and definitely any house can have a garden right um, but what helps them with uh, having a co-op uh, garden is that you know that you're in it with a bunch of other people and they're all doing this work together, and so we motivate each other to like actually get out there on weekends. Whereas a lot of people that just you know garden from their home, they get kind of discouraged halfway through the season, and then things die and then they stop. Um, so that's really great. Um, we know there's also we're big enough that there's a pool of people. So there's like you know one person who's like a really great gardener who then can direct everyone else, you know, if they need the direction or anything like how to garden and stuff like that. So. That's definitely a big part of how our co-op works. Um, yeah, we have problems. Sorry, could you say that one more time? Um, it, it, it can be tricky to find people who, who have all those like different skill sets, um, but I think that we we do good outreach. Um, you know, we try to get as we have a wonderful community here in Davis that we can draw upon, um, who already have like a little bit of a sense of how cooperation works and then there's people within that group that have lots of great specific skills so yeah we're able to consistently pull in people that um, love to garden and people that love doing maintenance work and people that love doing boards work governance work all those things so it's a good mix that's how yeah and with each you know there's transitions you know with one person leaving and another person coming in and so the community is always evolving and changing and sometimes we'll be better at something and sometimes we'll be better at something else you know and it just depends on who's who's here and what what skills people have in the house at any given moment. What do I what do I do to outreach? Or, what do I, oh, um, I'm one of the more social people, so I do a lot of um, I do I'm the applicant coordinator. Um, I plan parties, I'm on the board, so lots of kind of um, organizational, more of the organizational stuff. Um, when we put together um, a 450 person volunteer community building project, Molly coordinated all those volunteers. An amazing job. I'm that. a people person. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Good one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We never have a hard time with that. We we always have at least three times more many people than we have spots, and oftentimes more like ten times. Yeah, and they're all great applicants, and so it's actually really hard to pick people sometimes because we're like, oh my gosh, this person's great, this person's great, this person's great, this person's great. How do we, you know, like it depends on what we need at the time, you know, like if, if we don't have people who are interested in the board and we need board members, or we don't have people who want a garden, we want more gardeners in. So it. A lot of it is like the skills that people can bring, but definitely there's there's not a lack of people who want to live here. Yeah, and then on the other side of that, it's like, oh my gosh, so many people want what we the, the, the great things that we are you know, privileged to enjoy here, and so we take it as a responsibility to try to make more houses. So um, this house is only this two houses together. This household um, is actually only a year and a half old. Um, we our, our organization has been existing for a couple decades. Um, and just put this together. So 
uh, we're ch constantly trying to expand, uh, not constantly expanding, but like trying to make sure that we're, we're providing as much affordable, stable housing as possible. I mean, this is the first time our first, we had our first person move out about a couple weeks ago, and that was about a year of living together yeah. in this house. So it depends, and we have a couple more people moving out, so probably, hopefully people live here for a year, but then it's staggered, so at any, you know, it could be like the whole community changes after a year or less, depending on who moves in. And, you know, one person coming in can totally change the dynamic of the house, so it, that's dependable. It could be where, like, everyone lives together for three years and then a bunch of people move out or something, so it's it's variable. We, we do actually have a rule inside the organization that people can't live at any of our three houses um, for more than six years. So we do see it as like, an educational opportunity, and it is, like, it's a tremendous privilege to be here. Um, and so we do want that there to be some turnover, and that's actually in the rules we set for ourselves. What else do you like about living here? I love, the, the food is like a big part of it, honestly. Um, and it's not just the food, but it's like getting to share the food and like sharing gardening skills and cooking skills. And like I've learned so much about how to cook just from the people I live uh, d definitely just like all different kinds of people that come in like so when you go out to make your friends like you choose friends like somewhat based on like yeah we have these common interests and yada yada but when you're in a co-op situation um, you end up like hanging out with people that like you wouldn't normally just like call up like to like hang out <laughs> um, and it really forces you to you know expand the kinds of folks that uh, that you're aware of and get a better sense of just diversity of experience of life um, there's some people that are very, very quiet and you can even be living with them for months and months and then you don't have much of interaction. And then one night at like 2 a.m. when you're both getting toast in the kitchen or something, you have this amazing conversation where they just like pour their heart out or you do the same. Um, and that's the sort of experience that just typically really doesn't happen in other kinds of housing situations. Yeah, the skill sharing, just to go off what Justin said, um, Everyone brings such different skills, you know, there's the, the kind of the physical skills of maintenance or gardening and then there's the organizational skills and all living in one household where where, where it's in, the intention is kind of to have that broad base of skills is really uh, such a beautiful part of it, you know, and just how like the symbiosis of like different people coming together to have one kind of goal in mind but having the different parts that make it function well. Yeah. Our co-op is, it's not entirely unique. There, there are like other, <laughs> we're all unique, all is unique, just as unique. Um, our, our house is, um, well, it's, 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 it's unique, I'd say, in some ways, um, at the scale it's at. Um, there's an awful lot of co-ops that are either a, Totally informal, and it's maybe like five people living together in a cool house, you know, that may or may not be a co op in some people's lives. There's a lot of other co ops that are like hundreds of people living together. Um, the scale that we're at, where we have three houses with about eight members each, and then um, a relationship with a co housing community of 24 people, and we're all underneath the same umbrella. Um, that is, that's not unique, but it's maybe a little bit more random those are other sorts of situations and in some ways like we're either going to get bigger from here or we're going to maybe scale down as we get it. the physical of this specific co-op the physical um, uh, space like the the co-op having two houses i mean it gives a lot of space and a lot of communal space um, and a deck and having the land around um lots of co-ops are one house you know like either two stories or just one house um or kind of co-housing where there's like individual units that are not, you know, don't share walls. But this is the, um, it's, you know, I think of it as like a two-story house taken this one story off and placed right next to each other and connected by a deck. And so I haven't seen very many co-ops at all that have this, uh, this layout. Um, our 
Our co-op was started um, in, oh god, 78, I mean, you mean the co-op, the SCHA? Yeah, SCHA. Are, uh, are you referring to this co-op, yeah. or? Oh, okay. Oh, 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 right. um, about, you probably know it better, but about three years ago? Um, what came first, the land opening, or? Or the house, Justin oh, should tell Okay, it. okay. Um, story for house. So, many decades ago, there was a house here called Club J, and it was kind of a co-op sort of ish, uh, just run informally by friends. It burned down, um, and that was really sad. And then this lot just sat empty for years and years and years and years. Well, um, in the meantime, the house right across the street over there um, was the Davis Art Center, and then it became our uh, our second uh, house of uh, so Solar Community Housing Association. And so we were thinking like, well, great, let's try to get another house in on this empty lot right across the street to be able to share all kinds of stuff and just work out so well. And uh, we got the opportunity to do that when um, some developers uh, just a couple blocks down uh, the street wanted to knock over to, uh, two houses. Um, but they were historic houses, one of them was. And so it would have cost them a tremendous amount of money to demolish that to make room for what they wanted to do. So instead, they donated the houses to us. We paid to move them a couple blocks down the street, plunked them down on this empty lot, got community volunteers and a lot of really hardworking contractors um, and donations of supplies and all that kind of stuff to set up these two houses. And then, yeah, we moved in about, or the first batch of people moved into this, uh, called the North House, because it's more northerly than the Southern House, um, in about August of last year, July? Mm -hmm. August of last year, so it's been about a year since, oh no, it was March of last it was year. March, yeah. March of last year, yeah, and then a fi I think both houses were inhabited by September of last year. And, uh, we've been making it work ever since. What kind of people live in this? Um, I would say, and this is true of lots of housing co-ops, which our specific co-op really wants to change, but it's often a very ecologically minded kind of person um, lives here because they like the, you know, the gardens and, um, and uh, in many co-ops it's kind of a, a middle class privilege type of person that is attracted to co-ops, um, which is, I mean, it, it's what it is, but it's a little unfortunate that it's, it doesn't have a, 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 the most diverse um, base of people that kind of tend to flock towards the co-op living. Uh, we, at our co-op, so there is, you know, it, it's, at our co-op we're working to outreach a little more to a more diverse, but it's hard because often the, you know, everyone's different, but a, but a similar type, a similar demographic is attracted to the co-ops, which I personally see as unfortunate because I think this has benefit, could have benefits for all kinds of people, and I would like to see more diversity, um, you know, in all kinds of, in any sense of the word. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, what in, in all the houses that I've lived in, and all certainly in our house, what we've found is that it is really hard to, once there's a culture that's established of like a certain kind of person that's in that space, it's really hard to for someone else who doesn't quite fit that mold to come in and like make the really brave jump and say, yeah. "Oh yeah, I'll be feel comfortable. yeah, I'll feel comfortable here." Um, and so that comes up around food because uh, we cook all of our meals uh, mostly vegan. Um, usually vegetarian, um, and there's, you know, a, a, a minority of meat eaters, and it's really important that that minority of meat eaters feels comfortable, um, and not all people who are ecologically conscious are vegetarian, um, but at the same time, people sometimes don't feel comfortable, like, cooking meat in front of vegetarians, so that's, like, one thing that, like, we've been you know, working on, on making more accessible. Um, the other thing that we found when we tried to do outreach um, and pull in people that were different from us, like we came up, run up against, well, first of all, like who are we saying we are, that we're trying to do something different, and then we're trying to pull in people that are different from that, um, and so we had to, you know, we're constantly having to check ourselves and our image of who we are and what is difference and what it means to bring people in, yeah. but then on a more practical level, we're just like, well, we, all, we know, we have the circles of friends that we have, 
um, and that sort of limits us like to who is going to move in. So um, we'll, at the end of the summer, we're doing an event um, with Western Service Workers Association, which primarily serves uh, low-income folks and all, a lot of Latino folks in particular, um, to do a aggregation and distribution um, day where we have to take food and clothing and appliances um, as donations and then be able to consolidate for them to give out to their member base. Um, so that's like an example of something that we're trying to do to broaden out our relevance to the larger community. But it's definitely hard. It's definitely hard. Um, yeah, I mean, our, our, in terms of like folks with disabilities, like our houses are ADA compliant. Um, and we, you know, could have, you know, our personal disabilities moving in um, if they were like, used a wheelchair in particular. But um, again, it's a question of like, well, are those people going to feel comfortable in a house that has this pre-existing set of abilities within its membership? So that's something we just got to work hard to push out and expand. I just would encourage everyone to check it out, not necessarily, you know, like, everyone, like, just come to our house or another house and, um, talk to the people who live there, uh, because we always want more people, and, and, you know, people should push their boundaries to come here because it's really great and I found it to be a very supportive community and, um, and, and we also want our boundaries pushed, you know? And so, like, we like that kind of dialogue and intention and, you know, just all kinds of people I think should experience, even just for a dinner, but just experience what it could be like living with people intentionally. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And, and to anyone who is interested in doing something like this um, in another area, you know, I would say really, I mean, you have to be a good listener and you have to be, you have to feel a connection to, to your community. And if you can do those two things, then pretty much no matter else who you are, what your needs are, your abilities, then I think, you know, you'll make a good fit in a, in a cooperative. <laughs> We hope. Yeah. <laughs> we hope that they can. I mean, we hope that they could and will and and would. Um, by you know, hosting events there or being a space for people to use um, for meetings or for uh, you know social events. But that's that is the hope because. What's the good of? I mean, you know, having a community is is only so good, but if it, if, unless it benefits the larger community, I think that's when it really like has its impact. Did you set it off? <laughs> <laughs> didn't catch all that. Can you think of any reason that that um, someone should be involved in Definitely. to help? Definitely. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, so for instance, on, on the, our board of Solar Community Housing Association, we have um, a lot of people who don't live in our houses now. Um, they all used to. Um, or live in similar communities. Um, but it's definitely worth something getting involved in, in the sense that um, even if you don't live there, because it is such a great nexus for community, and when people move on from these houses, they take the experience with them, and they have, you know, a, an alumni network, if you will, um, to draw on. Um, definitely anyone that's interested in, in, if not living in, then like developing other communities um, like this, like should definitely obviously be involved. Um, yeah, I mean, well. some people, there's, you know, some people want to live alone and don't like being around a lot of people. Um, 
but want, and then there's different models of co-ops, you know, like co-housing where there's individual units, um, and you can kind of really maintain that personal space, but still have some of the benefits of cooperatives and the cooperative model. Um, like, like there are lots of people this would not work for, you know, like people, some people just don't, you know, they're introverts and they don't get fed by people. And not that introverts can't live here because that's totally not true at all, but it is a certain personality type also that might be more drawn to this, but, um, there are definitely models within the cooperative uh, model that could work for all different kinds of people on like a personal level. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I totally agree with what Molly says, and, and actually also at the same time, like being an introvert myself, I, I find that's actually one reason why I and a lot of other people I've lived with over the years are drawn to this model. It's because it's precisely those people that don't go out of their ways to make social connections a lot of times or have trouble doing that and they need an excuse kind of to... To, to have those late night, you know, uh, toast meetings or whatever, you know, it is, um, that's, this is a great place for that. Um, and I feel like actually recently, last year, we've had a couple of people that, um, that lived here who are, fit that mold kind of well, who they like to get involved. They don't know how to make small talk all the time, um, or just like, you know, party and, and have a great exuberant time. Uh, they, it, they can get drawn into that though, and they have a space where they can sort of participate on that. Maybe like not from the center, but like from the side, and that means so much to them. So. Um. Well. In the long term, we hope, I think, that co-ops are not externally financially supported. We hope that they really just are able to take care, uh, their members are able to take care of themselves. And that's like the ultimate goal. Um, but initially starting up, I mean, we're living in a society and in an economy that does not honor this kind of democratic economic participation. And so, yes, you need to do that work. Just like... You know, we live in a patriarchal society, so you can't just depend on people to naturally just, like, be anti-sexist and, like, to do that work, right? It takes specific intention to go against the grain of what's already happening. So, by analogy, I think it is important that co-ops do ex receive some external financial support, um, at least when they're starting up. Uh, and the benefits of that, of someone uh, choosing to support that, is get tapped into an amazing community and also to contribute to something that's going to be self-perpetuating. Um, Co-ops don't make grant applications every year because once they get started, um, they're able to support themselves. 